So we'll be also be studying stress-free stockmanship a lot. How to move cows, because that's another key factor. How do you handle and how do you guide cows? So we have a training session in June where we have all these trainings open, open, open training days, cow things a la carte, where we also have the stress-free stockmanship. But here you see what a cow needs to get up. What do you see here? What is she doing? What can this cow do what she can't do in your barn? Lunging forward, lunging a meter, what's seven, 67, uh, sorry, 65 centimeters lunging forward. So you need quite a bit of space eh, if you are a cow. You really need a lot of space to stand up. And that's essential space. If you don't have the space to stand up, you can't put your head ahead. You will fall down harder when you lay down and you will also hit metal on the sides. So if you don't have that space for your contraweight out there, you will have more hard hitting on the ground and it's a lot more difficult to stand up. And if you can't stand up, you won't eat so much because you only go five times a day for dinner and not seven or ten or twelve times. So look at her and listen to this cow. So what three, what three places did she get wounded? Where did she hurt herself? On the, on the spine, eh? you already saw the wound. On the side of the spine here, she's banging it. She's trying to get up, front legs, back legs are wrapped on the floor. So the cow shouldn't be laying on mattresses. If you still have mattresses, think about it because you need something better. This is Germany, 17 years head banging. And the cows are banging, banging and trying to tell them the farmer's story. And the, the wall was still there when I was there. I said, open it up. And it's like a prison, you know. They're trying to get with help from the outside. He's trying to open it from the outside, this cow. And also here, you see, they were blowing the metal for <laughs> 70 years. And finally, there was a whole <sighs> air. So cows are telling the story. They tell you what to do. But people don't want to see it. In Denmark in 69, they already knew that a cow needed 3 meter 20 to stand up. This was, this was in 69, Anonymous, Mr. Anonymous came with this picture. Then the university in, in Wageningen made a drawing. It's ridiculous, it doesn't, it's not correct. Because the head is in a, in a bended position, so this is normally the head space. Now we still need the swing space, so they, do, they just don't understand it. There's a lot of more space that cows need, so we calculated this to 2 meters from the cow the front knee till the tail is two meters. How long are the mattresses? Very happy, to, by the way, to have one of the builders in here, one of the machine companies, because if you're selling stuff to farmers, you better sell the right thing. And less than 5% in the market is cow suitable. The rest is only business suitable and not your business. So buy the right things. If you buy, buy the right thing. It has to be two meters long. And then you need uh, another uh, 70 centimeters for the head. Cow is 2 meters 70, that's, set, that's 9 foot. And then you need 2 foot swing space, 65 centimeters. And that means 335, 11 foot space that you need. And if you do a double cubicle, they can use each other's head space. So this is what you need, but this is what you don't need. And this is what you need. It's not that difficult. So this cow, what's wrong with her? Seeing the signal, see what you do. A brand new barn, very good decision making in, in, in nine out of ten fields, but one mistake. He didn't go for a deep bed, and he, well, it's not the width of the cubicles. Well, the width is also a critical issue in Holland. They make them far too narrow. Economically, it should be 125, the cubicles, and they still think they can make them smaller, which is a mistake. But in this case, it's too short. You see her hanging over the edge with her udder. She's hanging over. 20, 30 centimeters. So this is a typical, it's like me in Italy. When I go to Italy, skiing, snowboarding, I, um, I have these small beds, and I'm 195, like this cow needs for her bed. And I get a bed of 170 in, in Italy. You know, and the good thing is, I don't shit in my bed, okay? That's a good thing. But I lay in the bed like this, and I can still get out. But the cow is just <laughs> shitting her bed, stressed out, ruining her backbone and her hocks. And she will never see the fourth and the fifth lactation. And the question still is why? So this is a Swiss guy. He understands it really well. He made all the beds two meters long. By law in Switzerland, it has to be 195 centimeters. 
Okay, that's a low in Switzerland, but he said we make them five centimeters longer. We just make a flexible neck rail and another flexible string that you don't see here yet in the front, and the, and the neck rail goes to one meter sixty. A high neck rail, it can never hit metal anymore. Excellent. Or the green stalls are very popular in Switzerland. Uh, flexible stuff for cows. So we design stuff now. My, my, my guys have a barn design uh, advice team. We said we have to have uh, soft baths, chopped straw and, and limestone and water is a very popular mix, or sand. And uh, we designed two row barns with one feeding place per cow. And we say, well, we have a stress-free calving line that the cows can quietly calf without help. They don't need help. 90% is calving by themselves. And the stress-free calving line looks like this on, on a, on a two-row dairy. And we, we typically have 120 cows in here, and we give them 120 square meters of straw. Now, the six cows before calving and six cows after, that's the maximum. And that's one of the big successes of our VetFi's Dairy Logics robot barn design. It's now the standard in the world. We designed this in 2006. It took us in 2011, it was finally the first one was built. And, um, and he got a $100,000 award from the Canadian government as the most innovative step in agriculture that year. So, and now finally it's coming, becoming a new standard. I'm very happy to say that we have also one in Scotland now and, and a few in England. Uh, we call the VetFi's Dairy Logic Robo Style, I'll show you in a minute. Another big thing is a stress-free stockmanship. Educate people not to hit and to chase cows. You should only drive your cows and start with baby cows. Start making connection with baby cows and train them. It's training a dog. I train my dog, I train my children, and now I'm training my sheep, and now I'm training also cows. But the main thing I do is training farmers to, to do the right thing with, with baby calves. Never abuse them, so always be trustworthy. So having a few golden rules on your farm, that's the first step. We don't hit cows, we don't. I was in Australia, in, in Ostasia, in, in, in China, amazing. I couldn't believe it. They were so quiet with their cows, and nobody was doing something wrong with them. They just gave them the time to walk, they walked behind them with a, with a long distance. Just walking behind them, no shouting, no hitting. Everybody on the farm knew that. They were sacked on the, the same day if they were hitting cows. Simple rules. And it will help, but you have to give them also the, the space and the possibility and the grip on the floor. So you have to, as a manager, you have to see what you have to do to make life easier for your man and your cows. Hoof signals. We made an excellent book on hoof signals. We made excellent video learning on this. And it's about the four cornerstones, the four legs of healthy hooves. It's looking at it at a different perspective. We wrote a healthy cow guideline, and I'd like you to, if you want, sign in uh, your email address if you want. Um, we'll send you the healthy cow guideline, and I'll leave these on these four tables here. The healthy cow guideline is doing four, three things right for cows. Well, actually, it's based on the cow singles diamond. Yeah, it's feed water, light air, rest and space. And the three main things that are not in place yet is soft deep bed. We started with soft deep beds in Holland several years ago, and we had, uh, well, 15 years ago actually, it was our first spear point. We saw that on the deep bedded farms with deep straw and sand and, and uh, deep sawdust or dried manure remnants, fine if you have good ventilation. We have 2,000 farms with dried manure now in Holland, almost, out of 18,000 farms. So there's maybe 3,000 3, with straw, 2,000 with um, dried manure, quite a few with horse manure mixes with, with, with wood shavings. And, and all these soft bedded farms, they were in this top 10, when I, top 1% when I did the research. In the top 1% research, all of these farms had a D bed, 100%. And from the other 30 that are producing half of the production, that we had, they were on, on, on 29,000 liters, and these were on 50, 55 average thousand liters. And the guys who were in the top all had a deep soft bed. So in these last 15 years in Holland, we went from 3% to 30% deep beds. But the other 70% is still not there. They, they still think they can manage it. Of course, they don't have the funding and the money to, to change the whole system. But we say, do it, do it as cheap as you can. Make a deep bed for cows. If you still have a mattress, you can start putting extra sawdust or a lot cheaper, extra dry manure on stock, uh, dry manure solids. Some, some companies uh, legalize it. If you have very good ventilation, it's a very cheap method that you could use. And every 100 gram more bedding is seven more minutes resting. So if you put a kilo extra bedding material on, on, on top of your mattresses, you have a, a lot less wounds and you have more, um, more success, more milk, more resting time. So number one was a deep bed. Number two 
is a, is a stress-free calving line. And um, I come to that in a minute, a stress-free calving line that cows can quietly calve two weeks before till two weeks after calving. And number three is one feeding place per cow. And yesterday, the Canadian farmer here asked me about, is it really necessary if you have a robot farm? Well, we turn it around. All the new farms we design, we design for 70 centimeter feed space. Two feet, four inch, 70 centimeter per cow. And every dry cow goes to three feet in uh, space nowadays. It was 85 centimeters. Now new research came out, it should be 90 centimeters. Dry cows must eat. If they eat, they don't get sick. So feed space is still highly debated by farmers because 80% of the people is talking rubbish. They just repeat what other, other people do. And if you do what everybody else does, you end up doing the wrong thing. You have to think for yourself. So 20% is, is making the right decisions. They probably, most of them are here now. But you have to make your own decisions and, and based on common sense and knowledge. And everything I'm telling you today is, is really based on practical knowledge from the best farmers in the world. A two-row farm gives you one feeding place per cow and a very good stress-free calf line, maximum air and water in, and then you have, with, with enough clean water, you have a very good system. So, another discovery we made from our trainings, we saw that farmers are listening to farmers. Farmers don't listen very well to advisors. So that's why we started to train advisors to become a trainer. So we have now 350 trainers that are doing these workshops with 10 farmers in the barn. And we also have a lot of herd managers and farm owners to train their staff on essential things, on cow behavior, cow health, and, um, and uh, just see what the cows do and what they need. Why are these one, two, three, four cows standing there and not resting? Because it's a mattress, because there's not enough bedding, and because the neck rail is too short positioned. And it's all doable, yeah? you can kick out the wall. He already kicked out the wall, this guy. So now we build only roofs nowadays. We don't build any side walls anymore. We have maximum ventilation in the system. So after doing these workshops, the farmers were telling us, hey, this is actually a very good idea. And the farmers were excited because, ah, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And we did a lot of sessions with two weeks in between or a month in between, and we have 100% change. If you go with me in a, in a dairy farm, you will change the next day. That's almost 100% success rate. It's amazing. And it's mainly because the other farmers are telling what they are already doing, and then the other farmers say, hey, I can do that. If I'm telling you what to do, you're not going to do it. But go and visit uh, Bruce Mackey. He's in the house here. He just built one of our brand new concepts, beautiful barn with sand. Just have a look at his farm. He's in Aberdeen, a few hours drive, I think, three hours drive from here. But there are good examples around the country. If you want to see more, come to Holland. In Holland, we have the most labor efficient and the most sustainable dairy industry at the moment, right? due to a few things that finally we're building the right buildings and we're getting the right knowledge to farmers. After a knowledge project, we went from 30% mastitis to 26% mastitis. With our other health book, with a glove campaign, and with four trainings that we made, three out of these four trainings about how to inject cows, how to do a better stress-free calving management, how to prevent mastitis, how to work on resistance. So we went back 4%, it was a big success. Um, so if you give attention on farm to things, we have been proven, this will be this proven successful. We also see this figures from Ireland where they do a lot like this. It, it's working, but you have to be open and start doing this. And you can organize yourself for your staff or, or with two or three farms together. We have a network of, of calcium trainers in the area. Do not only use the hands, also use the brains of the, of the workers. Because a lot of people have their staff as, okay, do this, do that, but they, they don't really use their brains. So we made a program now to reach the rest of the world because I'm, I'm reaching a lot of decision makers, a lot of farm owners, but I don't reach enough farm workers yet. So we make a video program. And it's a very simple uh, tool, our five hour training, which is two and a half hours lecture, two and a half hours in the barn. And just with a camera following me, we just go step by step how to really understand what cows need and what they want. It's an excellent program. Also, uh, Bruce here did it. Who did this video program? Can I see fingers? Who did it? Quite a few English have been signing in. Yeah, there's four people in the room are doing it. Um, it's, um, we sold 300 of these programs now, and it's, it's the basics of what a cow needs. What I just showed you, but then a bit more into detail, and why and how. We made the same one for hoof signals and for young stock signals. Amazing. The five months that we are losing there in young stock rearing, that is big money. The return on investment is immediate. So... What took you so long? That's my question. 
So how do you persuade people and how do you convince people? So I'm trying my best in this uh, 45 minutes to persuade you to do a better job. And it's not that difficult because I look at myself. How did I change in the last years? How did I become a better person? How can I be a better listener? And it's a constant challenge to look better at body language and to understand people. So if you know how people learn, what do you think is the most, uh, the most preferable learning uh, way? Is it looking, listening? Is it doing and feeling? Or is it uh, thinking? Well, the thinkers make all the papers and the text, but actually only 3% of the people like to read and to think. So 85 of the people, your dairy staff, yourself, they want to see things and they want to hear things. And that's why we make picture books and video, because then we have, with video we have everything. So we like to change people and we like to give them the carrot and the stick is the old method of training, but we're looking at new motivational skills. How can you motivate your staff? And this is not the best way of training your staff to get them forward. It's not the best way of, of moving a cow or moving your staff. So you have to tell them, you have to show them, and you have to really involve them. So just starting this, this video program, we call it the Cow Sales Coffee Break. You can do it, it's a five hour program, it's 29 videos. You can do it every week for five minutes or every month for a half an hour. And your staff will love the attention. All right, let's sit together. You do a little bit of translation, and if they don't understand, they, you can show them. It's all visual. And they will look better. They look for these signals in their own barn where they're working. And then they come up with good ideas. The best ideas come from your people. You want to have a self-steering team on your farm that they are aware of things. And what, what this guy says, an interesting TED talk you like to see, eh, to inspire yourself. I, I look quite a bit of TED talks the last time. Uh, lately, TED.com, and you see this inspiring movie of uh, Daniel Pink. He said, we have to give them autonomy, give them, give them freedom to make their own decisions or to make their own, um, um, give them their own responsibility for the job. And give them mastery, educate them. And that's what we do. And give them a purpose. We work on healthy cows. We work on a better world. We want to feed babies. We, we, we want to sell healthy powder milk to China to give their babies a good start. So give them a purpose that is higher than cleaning manure or milk my cows. Guy in New Zealand from Neil Chester, a friend of ours, he comes a lot to Holland to train our guys. And uh, Neil said, one of my farmers, when there's a new employee coming, he comes in and um, he said, where can I, uh, where are the cows? What can I do? Uh, should I drive a tractor today or milk your cows? He said, no, 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 today. Today you're going to meet my cows. Okay, what's that about? Well, you just use a clipboard and you go in the barn, uh, in the field. You saw them already when you drove up the lane. There are the cows. Stay out there for two hours. And you're just going to sit in the middle of the field. Just sit there, take your pen with you. You got a cow sickle pen. <laughs> and you're going to score the cows. You're going to just look at them and see which five are coming to you first. Those are your friends, okay? Write down the numbers, because these five that are coming first, they are your friends. Good to know, good to know your friends. They trust you already. Then you look at uh, the next five, the five big ones. So then you can stand up after a while, and you're going to look around and hurt a bit. Write down the five big ones, write down the five small ones, the numbers. And then you're going to look at the last ones there in the back. You're going as far as you can up to them, until they get a bit of signals of being annoyed. Then you stop, and then you're going to write their numbers as well. These still need need some, you need to train them a bit for trust. So don't go too near, just go as far as they are alert, and then just say hello to them, write a the number and go back. Simple things. How, how different from a start on a dairy on the first day, eh? Just imagine if you can do that with your staff. Meet my cows, two hours, and he's aware that he's working with cows that, that are living beings, that, that also need respect and attention, and that cows are probably eh, as smart as people. And the Dalai Lama was, was quoting, you have to have respect for people, for animals, and for plants. They're all living creatures. Let's respect them all. Having this said, have people signals is what we do. We train people to become a group leader, a better trainer. And the difference between pulling the car or steering the group is like, what kind of leadership are you showing as a, as a, as a, as a farm owner? Uh, quite a few of you have quite a bit of staff. So how do you do that? How good are you in sensing Connecting and leading. It's sensing skills is um, listening, listen, feel, smell, and, and look. That's the sensing, what comes in your brain. And then you have the connecting part. You want to make the connection. 
So you have to be really good in clear, clear message and very honest. And we, they say the Dutch are too clear and too honest. <laughs> we are very blunt. But you can only do that with a maximum amount of empathy and respect. And I really yeah, have a lot of respect for people and I empathize with people. Yeah, I worked on dairy farms myself, I understand the work and, and when things go wrong, what it, what it takes. So, but if you show this empathy and respect to your staff, you will do an, a lot better job and you can more clear and honest and they have more effect. So in our trainings, we score these, all these points. What are you good at and what can you improve on? Look for yourself. And then the last one is leading. Leading skills is also about finding the balance. The balance between ROI, relation, the connection with people, the organization, how is it organized, checklist, uh, work protocols, and the I, the information. What do they have to know? A good book, uh, a video, a theory stuff. This is what we expect. So if you find the right balance between relation, organization, information, ROI, you also have the right return on investment. And then you get people in action. And that's why we get 99% uh, of the people joining our trainings. We get them in action. They make the next step. They make the next move. So a few more cow issues. This is Texas. What do you see? Going back to cows. Cow signals. This is a fresh cow group in Texas. What do you see? There's five signals in this picture. Very interesting signals. How good are you in observing? It starts with observing. It's too hot. <laughs> you can see it from the picture, it's too hot. It's very good. And that's why they have a roof over the cows, but not far enough. You see, there's still quite a few cows not under the roof. What else do you see? They are here for four weeks, these cows. What do you see? The most of them are eating, which is a good signal, but still there's 10% not eating. There's 15 cows and there were another 10 cows out of the picture not eating. So 10 cows that like to eat, and the other 10, they, well, they gave up, they know we're not going to make it now because all the dominant cows are eating. And that is a critical mistake. Your fresh cows should be never under pressure. So instead of having them here for four weeks, you should have to have them only for three weeks and move the cows three, after three weeks to the next group, let them overstock over there, but never in your fresh cow group. And this, this is a management decision that is always made too late, always when I come to the farm. Oh yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> So you can't do that. Your fresh cows deserve better. They have to have one feeding place per cow. And what else do you see? Well, some diarrhea signals on the tails if you look carefully. You also see an interesting scoring system here. I like it. It's very simple. Very, very effective. They do, uh, this is actually um, uh, the blue stripes, 10 times. No fever, 10 days, excellent. Sometimes there's a red stripe and you know uh, he had an injection. But you see the striping, you see the date of calving. So they're never longer than a month, so they just put a date of calving on the cow. Very, very accurate. The day of calving, the 20th of January. And then they put tail paint on. Isn't that amazing? For the first month. Why would you put tail paint on? For heat detection. So how many cows do you see on your dairy already in the first three, four months? Uh, sorry, in the first three, four weeks. How many cows show heat? Anybody? How many cows do you already show heat on your farm in the first three, four weeks? 25%? Anybody more? 50%? Who said that? So some farmers telling me this. I have already seen 50% in the first three, four weeks. And I, I mark this heat and I know uh, there will be a, sometimes a little shorter interval. So 18 days later, there will be the second one. And 21 days later, and then we inseminate them. So they already know in this group when they're going to inseminate these cows, roughly for more than 50% of the cows. And I think by just looking what you do, you can already find 50%. With this tail paint, you probably get even more. I love fancy tools like, like uh, the, 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 the colors, uh, the heat detection. We do a big research now. Eh? We, we work with all the guys with, with sensors, sensors, and we work with NADAP a lot. We did a big research called the VETFIS NADAP um, uh, and Utrecht University uh, um, exercise we do now. We, we, we're measuring dry cow management and we're looking at stress-free calving lines. And we're looking at 12 farms, all the data, and the difference between the resting of a dry cow in a straw yard or in a horrible cubicle with a cow that is 10% more big and heavy than a normal cow, they are in the same cubicle of less than 4 feet, 1 meter 10 sometimes, which is too short and too hard. What do you think the difference in lying time is? We're looking at eating times, lying times. It's a very interesting new set of data we are studying now. On one farm, they have only eight hours resting. 
where they have a, a very bad, the average cow is resting 10 or 11 hours, the dry cows only rest eight hours. And in a straw yard, they rest 14 till 16 hours. So just think about it. Who of you has a straw yard for the last week before calving? Hands up, straw yard for calving. That's more than half, that's excellent results. And that's, uh, I'm very impressed what we have here in the house. I'm very happy that you all came here and to listen to me. But the half has it and the other half doesn't. And how can we make the whole industry doing this? Because we really increase our health a lot. If you have this straw yard for two weeks before till two weeks after, that would be even better. So how long can you keep them in and what can you do with it? There's one extra thing I want to give you. And who has a pamper pan and a cuddle box? Who has this already? Okay, we got one, yeah, one or two users. You do it? You do it like this? And you too? How do you do it? Can you explain it? So the baby comes out of the straw pack, you put him in a box, yeah. and the mother can lick the baby. Yeah. And, and are you milking the cow on this spot as well? Yeah. Wow. And why do you do that? Yeah, the Joni's plan, the, cows, um, uh, the calf is away from the cow, but she can still lick her and she will not get dirty. That's one of the reasons. You give milk from, your, from her own mother straight to the baby if the mother doesn't have Joni's. Is that what you do? Yeah. So and how do you do it? Do you milk the cow in this position as well? Yeah, we have a, we have a different place. So yeah. Like, like this one. And you milk the cow here? Yeah, yeah. And we take the calf away from the mother. So I just okay. Okay, but you take the calf away. And, but the thing is, what you were just saying here, this guy here, and this is what I see in, in, in some farms in the world already have been doing this for ages. They, what they do, the baby calves here, and we call this a pamper pan. So this is the stress-free calving line, yeah, whatever how many cows you have. But then you have a little corner, a little box, where you have the cow uh, separate if you are in time. If not, no worries, you just close the gate after she calves. But the moment she calves, you walk by, you pull the baby out of the straw yard. Because a lot of them get sick from eating diarrhea, eat, eating manure or licking manure from the cow or being in a dirty surrounding. So by doing this, this little thing different on your farm, you will have a lot less disease. You pull out the baby, put her in the box, then you have the mother licking her, you put her on top of good quality feed, okay? And some farmers put some feed over the calf. Have you seen that? Have you seen my video on Facebook? Put feed over the calf and then the cow will have their first meal within a half an hour after calving. So you have to give them a big bucket of water. Who's giving a big bucket of water? Who's giving 20 liters of water or more? Directly after calving. Yeah. So, okay, that's more than half the house. Who is taking the calf, away, the calf away immediately? Who's taking the calf out as quick as she can? Hands up. A lot of farms doing this for hygiene reasons. But we have been looking at this. This was a veterinary advice. It's not good enough for the calf and not for the, for the mother. So if you can keep them together and think about the perfect story to your consumers. Eh? Look at Muller and looking at... At, the, at all the companies here in the house, if you can sell this to the consumer, oh yeah, the, the, the babies are born and they, they're in a straw pack and then they are in the cuddle box with the mother. That's what everybody wants. And then they can lick, the mother can lick the baby. The, the mother is milked on this spot. Just think about the benefits if you do it like this. You have the colostrum out within one hour in the baby. The calves don't get sick anymore. The mothers don't get sick anymore. You milk her out completely empty. So, good dry cow feeding program and you don't have any risk for, for milk fever anymore. If you have a good calving uh, facility here, they will eat around the dry cow period. This is an interesting method with a simple swing gate. We have been designing this. We've seen this for 10 years. We designed the Dutch uh, university farm five years ago like this. It was a tremendous success. And now we're sharing it with the world because we think every farm needs a pamper pan and a cuddle box as a part of their stress-free calving line. So, a lot of technical stuff. A last video for you. This is about our, our barn design we do. This is a one-man business with, with two robots, 150, 140 cows, 125 cows milking, and uh, one man doing all the work in the barn, including the young stock. It's a new design we designed in 2006, and how does it work? Well, we have a grazeway or, or smart gate to the outside. The cows can always go out when they want. Also, the dry cows can go out. The dry cows are on the, on the top end. We have a separation area and a treatment facility here. So all the cows can be full automatically separated. Also the cows in heat. We know already eh, by, by the step counters, they will be separated. All the work is in, in, in the central position in the barn. And then uh, after the dry cows are dried, they go to the, uh, they are here the last two weeks, they come in a stress-free calving line. And then they will stay on the straw for one or two weeks after calving. This system, 
creates a tremendous labor efficiency and happy cows. They can see where they go, they know where they go, there's no stress. It's a very simple cow flow and a simple man flow. So this is well thought after uh, research on 25 robot farms in 2006, we're looking at what do farmers need? What do they have? What do they need? They all did something well and they did something very clumsy. So we came up with a new concept. It's a winning concept. This is the new standard around the world now. And, and we're very happy that Lely, the Laval, and they're all adapting our, our program. The old talent's theirs, but it comes from our, uh, our background. We developed this together with Jack Rodenberg from Vetvice Dairy Logics. So our last movie, and this is one of these robot barns. I told you, 17 cows left the farm with um, 67,000 years lifetime production. Yes, a 4-0 barn with two feeding tables on the left and on the right. You see only half the barn now. What are the cows doing after feeding the cows? Most of the cows go and have a bite. And they are relaxed. And they, um, they want to eat something. There's one lame cow, you see her? One lame cow on this farm. And there's no cows to, only the one lame cow didn't walk to the robot, so he had to pick her up. She's in the first one in, in the cubicle, sitting like a dog. But all the cows go voluntary, there's very little fighting, very little things going on. The cows can easily eat. Three drinkers along the way, so some of them drink a bit. You see the, the floor, a little bit in the slope? And the sand spilled in this lane, so we put rubber lane here. And a sand lane here, the cows can easily have maximum traction. So this is the Vetvice Dairologic Barn that we designed, because we want to have no more sick cows. And together with the stress-free calving line behind the robots, this is uh, not a new step. I was really ashamed to ask people to come to Holland 10 years ago. There was nothing to see in Holland. All the best farmers left all over the world. And I was inspired by them everywhere, in Canada, in, in Germany, in Denmark. I learned a lot. So then we said, let's build better buildings. And we started with this in 2006. And now, we're very proud to say we have the best farmers in Holland again, with the best farms, high labor efficiency, high outputs, and, uh, and, and um, yeah, very, very uh, much longevity. Cows living for five lactations. It is possible. You have to do a few things right, a few things different. The question is always, is it possible for every farm in the world? Well, I think yes. We, we're training guys in Africa now. We have been the new 10 trainers in Africa. And um, um, we made a book for the smallholders. So we work for the smallholders, we work for the medium size, and we work on huge dairies in China and Saudi Arabia. Everywhere, people have a lack of knowledge. And what I want to ask you is invest in knowledge transfer between farmers, between staff. I think that's where the key is. We can't blame, uh, and that's for the industry here, we can't blame the farmers for having 50% cows suffering. It's the whole industry that has to change, and has the, the politicians and the businesses have to think about what they can do to get more, get more knowledge into the farming system and maybe more funding, because uh, our Irishman told it also, it's our common responsibility to have animal health and welfare. And the people in London and the decision makers, they are aware of animal wealth, uh, health and welfare. They really want to do something. So make that money come your direction, but start, don't wait for that. Start doing the right things. Everybody can make this stress-free carving line if you don't have it. Make it big enough, make it bigger because you need to have it bigger. It's always too small. At least 10% of your cows you want to build it for. If you have 500 cows, you build 500 square meters of straw. And that will drive your business. No matter what the straw prices are. So to finish my story, and it's about time I think, this is my dad. My dad is using more straw. He's 73 years old, he's still lambing sheep, and he has a drier straw pack now. So he changed. That was one of our big efforts, eh? changing my own dad. <laughs> I spoke to a few young guys yesterday. They said that was my biggest concern, how to make dad change. And my kids, I take them to the farm. This is my next door farm. And this is uh, Pep, my youngest son. And we've got two daughters, and they're on the dairy farm. And he says, hey dad, how old is this cow? I said, well, she's already six years old and she's a happy cow producing a lot of milk. I said, okay, if she's so old, then I can drink that milk. I like to drink milk from happy and healthy cows. That's what we all want for our children. So thank you for watching. Thank you.